Hello, welcome everyone. I'll just wait a few more seconds while everyone's filing into the virtual Zoom room. Okay, let's get started. Welcome to, Mag to the launch of Magnum's fourth public seminar, The Making of a Photo Book, a guide for photographers and collectors with Alessandra Sanguinetti, Martin Parr, and Sorab Hora. I'm Amber Terranova, Magnum's Education Director, based here in New York City, joined by our partner and moderator, Holly Stewart Hughes, and joined by the contact sheets dating back 70 years behind me here is uh, Inga Morath on the shelves and Susan Mizellis, Eric Hartman. And to my left is Jim Goldberg's Raised by Wolves bootleg. About our moderator, Holly, she is an independent editor and writer on photography and media. And this is her fourth time moderating panels for Magnum. Today's Free Seminar brings together three of my colleagues who work with Magnum photographers on their book publishing projects. We're so pleased to have Cameron Foxhall, Chili Power, and Emily Graham here with us today. I'd like to thank you all in advance for your contributions today and during the webinar. It really is a great opportunity to discuss your recent observations on Magnum photo books distinctive in their design, production values, or content. So thank you all so much. And a special thanks to Capella Buncher, our education assistant in London. Just a few little housekeeping rules. After we hear from our guests, I will take your questions in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the edge of your screen. And we will not have the chat active during the webinar. So feel free to submit your questions as they come up. And I will hand it over to you, Holly. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Amber. Thanks for having me back. Um, over in this course of this webinar, um, I'm going to be talking to some photographers, uh, experienced book editors, um, a designer, a collector, a curator, about uh, what both photographers and collectors need to know about the creative choices that go into the making of an outstanding photo book, and, um, and also how those creative choices are inspired by the thinking a photographer does about the story they want to tell or what they want to say with their book and also the audience they want to reach with their book. So I'm delighted that today's panel kind of previews some of those themes that we'll get into um, from an interesting perspective, I think. Um, I'm going to briefly ask our um, panelists to uh, offer their titles and briefly explain what you do. Um, working with photographers at Magnum. Um, let's do it um, alphabetically by first name. So I'll start with you. Cameron, what's your title? Yes, so I'm Magnum Shop Coordinator and I've been at Magnum for almost four years now. Um, and I oversee all of our global fulfillment for the shop. So including the books, but also our posters. Um, and I work very closely now with Chile uh, and getting new publications and working with uh, publishers and the photographers on getting their titles on the shop. Uh, thanks a lot, Cameron. Chili, what do you do? Um, I'm the publications coordinator at Magnum, and so it's mainly the strategy and marketing behind photo books, um, from events to, yeah, as Cam said, actually getting the books on the site and speaking to the publishers about that. So quite a range of tasks, really. And you guys have chosen some really interesting books, distinctive in their in their content and their design that we're gonna be talking about um, today. And Emily, what do you do and where are you? Hi, yeah, so I am based in London. I work in the cultural team at Magnum's London office. So that means that I look after cultural programming in the UK. So exhibitions, cultural commissions and events and programming with cultural institutions. Um, including events that might be tied to the Pub, uh, the new release of a book yeah exactly so when a, often when a photographer has a new project be that an exhibition project or a book project or, or both um generally they will come to us in the cultural team and we'll see if we can work with them to um i, I suppose share the work get a bigger audience for the work promote the work 
Um, I have to say, Emily, you told me something because you're also a photographer and um, you have a book coming out soon. And you mentioned something that your publisher said to you long before the book was printed, well in advance, about like your responsibility for promotion. Am I putting that right? What was it the publisher said? Yeah, exactly. Um, so when we were first first discussing um, the book and the contract around the book, um, it was very much part of the discussion from the beginning that we were that, that the whole process is collaborative and we work together. But particularly in terms of um, you know once the book is is published, um, really what impacts upon the success of the book is is the kind of photographer's participation in the process so you know once the book is published and on the market it's an ongoing um, work between the publisher and the photographer to promote the book to think of ways to talk about the book to place the book or to place stories around the book um, and engage with different audiences through the book and I'll come back to you about that to about um, a magnet photographer you worked with thinking broadly about the community they could reach, about the broadest possible audience they can reach and to reach them in kind of a distinctive way appropriate to the book. But um, Capella, if you'd start um, showing some slides, um, I think we start Chile with some books that you, uh, I should say more broadly, publishing projects that you wanted to, to highlight and show. Yeah, exactly. Me those. Oh, that's us. This is a recap of who I am and Amber is. It's a recap of who our, our panelists are. So what's this, Chile? Um, so this is a Wombat art box. This is Christina de Medell's one. And I think it came out late last year. And so I wanted to talk about this because I think it really highlights the idea of what is a photo book. Um, so I guess this is more of a portfolio, but you can buy it at bookshops. It's the size that you put it on your bookshelf. So the one I've got is on my shelf, but all the pages are loose. They're all frameable and there's no set sequence because you can change it around. So I think I just thought this was a good way to start thinking about yeah, what a photo book is and when it cuts off and becomes something else. Um, and I guess this kind of is the same idea of having the loose prints, except this is alongside a photo book. So all of the prints that you get are all in the book. So, I mean, Cameron, do you have anything? Yeah, um, I think that so this is out by Skylark Editions. Um, and I think that this is a great example of accessibility to different audiences through price point, especially when considering it against Christina DeMiddle's art box, um, which is something um, that I think one could consider to be more of a collectible item. Um, it is a portfolio. It's produced at a higher quality using fine art papers. Um, and I know Wombat's can, you know, concept behind that was to be able to put the art in the viewer's hands and uh, this outs is similar to that, but um, it's a little less precious, is a little bit more, I think one can handle it a little bit better. Um, and I think it also kind of conveys this idea of active participation with the viewer of being able to shuffle the loose prints around um, and having active participation. And while it's something that's already constructive, as constructed, it's something that can still be changed and one can rearrange in a different sequence, um, but while still, you know, conveying that it's a portfolio. Hmm. Um, so this is Gregory Halpern's Omaha sketchbook, and I chose this based on the design and more so the process used. So the images here are set with a heavy varnish, which has to be applied by hand. And so the process of doing this takes a month per page. And I just thought having that, and so basically the images start to look like they're tipped in because of the varnish. Um, and this is furthered in the special edition, which shows images, they're C types, which are six by seven, same as these, but these are meant to look like C types, but the special edition shows 
real sea types stuck in so they look like the original so the book is a sort of facsimile of um Gregory's original process so this was what he was using as he was going through the project um so yeah I think this is a great way of looking at process in photo books and the importance of that and how that can change the project um so this was mainly in terms of production run by Morgan from Mac and I think also she's a great person to talk about because she uses Instagram to show when she's on press and you see the books being printed and sometimes it feels like you get a sneak preview of what's coming out of Mac and also almost like you guess the photographer it feels sometimes like a game because she doesn't say who it is but you know you see that um yeah so that's two things two things I think are interesting is I see photographers or do that so that for their followers on social media it kind of whets their appetite or lets them know what's coming yeah. up but what yeah, I also exactly. like about this is having talked to the designers and editors sorry can you hear the sirens I'm on a busy street in New York City um sorry the um how the design here really complements the story that form and content go together. That's something that the editors and the designer who are going to be on the panels talk about a lot as their, as their thoughts, but um, go ahead. You want to go to the next one? Um, so this is Dale's side, um, which is Lindo Sebequa's work with Cyprian Clement Damas. So um, Lindo is from South Africa and Cyprian is from France and Lindo is black and Cyprian is white and you see the two of them photograph Dale side which is a suburb of Johannesburg and so with the book the pages open out and they're separate so one is one photographer the other is the other so I think it was designed originally to be opened out at the same time so you see them as a sequence as diptychs and if you're doing that there are two points in the book where one image it crosses over to the other so you see half of the image on one page half on the other and I think this is a great like an example of appropriate design because it means that you can yeah look at the individual narratives or the collective and yeah show the divide and it allows for you to see that in both senses. Um, so yeah, a really great example of appropriate design and design that aids the work. Hey, Chili, a question just, um, I just wanted to point out to attendees. Um, we actually have, or Capella has laboriously made a printout of um, this presentation that includes captions and credits, um, titles, um, and that's, correct me if I'm over promising but and that will be that will be sent to you and we'll make sure to identify these um, photographers too next um, so this is opera aperta by Alex Mary Lee and um, I chose this because I think it really stands out in terms of design so you get five different books and it's four different types of paper and they represent three acts because he was working with a theatre at the time. And this was kind of during COVID, but I think the work started just before. Um, and yeah, I think it was just looking at design and how it's becoming more important to stand out with how many books coming out at the moment and how well designed everything is. So it was more of a um, passing thing, but yeah, it's in a cardboard box and then there are elastic bands around it. and. Yeah, it's just a great example of design, I think. So this is Sir Abhira's The Coast, um, which was self-published. So he took the photos, wrote the text, designed it, did the sequence, and then also distributed it. So he did absolutely everything himself. And so I believe he is doing one of the talks later on. He is, he's doing, um, he's our final panelist. Um, 
I can't remember entirely how many books he self-published, but if there's I think, anyone, cool. I think so. Anyone who's on this um, attending today is, is with me attending when Saurabh talks about his practice of self-publishing. Remind me to ask that guy if he ever sleeps because his, yeah. his thought and the work he puts into everything from not only like sourcing the cover materials, but finding bookstores, packing everything, getting it off to bookstores. I, I would like to know um, how he manages yeah. all of it with such attention to detail. It's really amazing. Yeah, so, yeah self-publishing, but also um, the design, each image is repeated. And so you see each image with a different pairing, which changes the meaning of each one, I guess. Um, and also I wanted to talk about this because he won the best photo book of the year, um, the Aperture Prize in 2019, and the book immediately sold out. So again, that, that was just a little extra bit. Yeah, I'm looking forward to asking one of the founders of that prize, Leslie Martin, who's speaking, to ask her about that judging and what she's learned from the winners, how they get judged. Um, so if folks have questions for the panelists, don't forget to use your Q&A box. Um, this looks a little different, Chili. What's, what's this series? Um, so this is Good Morning America by Mark Power, and it's an ongoing body of work. So he is um, publishing the books as he's working. So the aim is to publish five, and he's published three so far, but he's still going on trips to take photos. So... The work isn't nearly done, but he's already got a mock-up of what all five will look like and the rising sun. Um, and I, this is something I haven't really seen before, an ongoing body of work that is being published as you go, which is, of course, slightly risky that you're promising five books. So you have to have five books worth of photos. But also, um, I know that he was raising money for the project by selling five, and he, I think it still is. So you can buy all five as a pre-order. Um, but yeah, another thing about his work is that he um, promotes his books through Instagram. And with that, when he pushes the book, when he does the post, the first day he gets sales and then it can be quite quiet after that until he pushes it again. And it's just, yeah, the power of social media and how one post can do that, but also how... It really is just one day, the attention span and that kind of thing of, yeah, you see the post, you buy the book then, or you wait until the next push, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so this is Pandora's Box by Susan Micellis. Um, This is not a recent one, it's 21 years old, but um, I thought this was a good example of an, a book as an object and an art piece in itself. So um, the photographs are all from an s and sex club. And um, in the book, there are pages that are latex and rubber and mirrored pages and jet colored gels. And, you know, all kind of go back to this idea of the sex club. And yeah, another example of appropriate design and um yeah the book as the object and adding to the images in a way that you you can't add that kind of thing in an exhibition you can't have just extra pages of something else and so that really separates this work as an exhibition versus a photo book and how you can have aspects like that that you couldn't include yeah if you were showing the work physically Oh yeah, that's um that's a that's an interesting point. Yeah. Um this is also um by Susan. Um it's called Learn to See and it came out last year. Um and I haven't really seen it uh that many places, so I thought this was a good time to talk about it. Um so it is a kind of a resource for um it was so it was originally done with New York public school kids and um, it's 101 exercises of image making 
And so if you go on to the next slide, um, it says, yeah, collage as an example of a way to make images or playing around with scale or photo maps. And I really like the spiral bound. Um, I don't see that that often, but yeah, I thought, I just think this is a really nice book that I haven't seen that many people talk about. So I thought I'd highlight that. I also, the spiral bound is so perfect for this. Yeah. Um, so this is Carnival Strippers Revisited. So it shows the original book and the making of the book um, in a slipcase. And I think at the moment I've seen quite a lot of things like this where they're annotated versions of books that are you know, now completely out of print, impossible to buy really. And this book was originally printed in 1976. And so there were a lot of people that also weren't born when it was originally published. So it gives people an opportunity to own that book, but also the people that were able to buy the book, it means that they have a reason to buy this as well because they get a completely new book in the slipcase. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of revised editions, um, Alex Soth has one coming out um, with Mac, which is called Gathered Leaves Annotated. I think it's coming out in May. Um, and I saw in the information that Mac released that it's the first time that people are going to be able to own Broken Manual. Oh. So it's a 700 page book of five of his books and it's every single page of those books, they're just annotated. Um, so yeah, I think it's nice seeing these annotated books. So you are able to see the original while also seeing something different. Um, I know you have, you're gonna show, oh, Actually, well, I'm gonna, I have a question about making these promotional videos, but I'll come to that when we see the next, there's a, another video that we're gonna show that's a promotion. But um, Cameron, right, you picked um, this, can you explain this work? Yeah, so I wanted to touch base about Matt Black's American Geography Project. Um, this is the first iteration that he published, um, which is, it was originally actually called Geography of Poverty. Um, but I think that these are such great examples um, of reaching a wider audience. Um, in, in this series, Matt is going around to, you know, lower income communities who don't have access to clean water, um, regular health care. Uh, and one of his big goals was to show that this is America. This is what it looks like. Um, and so in doing that, he's also reaching a wider audience. Um, but this newsprint was just the first iteration. He went on to also publish a magazine, um, which I think is great in terms of accessibility. Um, he's reaching a wider audience that way as well. So maybe those who don't have the ability to purchase the magazine um, could have afforded to purchase the newsprint. Um, eventually, or recently, within the last year, Matt also published the traditional photo book um, with Thames and Hudson. Um, but going back, actually, if we could go back to the magazine, this is another example of a great edu educational tool because uh, it also functions as a pop-up exhibition. Um, and before COVID, it was set to um, tour around and it was exhibited at Ohio University, uh, which we'll actually be picking up back again soon. So you should keep your eyes out for that. Um, and the thought was being able to also bring this into schools so that people could have better conversations around the topics that Matt is talking about. Um, and on that note, he also has a great website called Reading um, American Geography, I believe. And it has a wealth of information and resources so that if you don't have access again to the photo book or the magazine, um, you can always go online and it shows like the full extent of documentation from this um, project, which is really amazing. And there's a short film that he provides there as well that you can watch. Um, and I know one of Matt's 
big motivations was to have people connect with each other through this too. And I think that's a, these are great examples of that, um, being able to have dialogue and discourse and discussion through something like the pop-up scene. Um, and it, I think it just also creates greater outreach to a wider audience too. Um, so yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about there. Um, this is a favorite book of mine recently. It's Hafiz by Sabiha. Um, and I think that this is an excellent example of great cover design um, and title page design. Um, you know, the physical format is one of the first things you see as a viewer reaching for a photo book. Um, it's your first interaction and introduction with an audience. Um, and I think that in this case, Sabiha did an excellent job with the illustrators and designers um, on echoing the themes that are representative in her work onto the illustration and the cover. Um, very reminiscent of the decor you, decor you see in Islamic architecture. Um, and it also feels sort of, I, I find it sort of intimate, um, which is something, a theme that's present in her portraits, these subtle moments. Um, and so, I, you know, while her, well, the cover is decorative, it's also um, symbolic with having the women in the headscarves, um, which I, I just think is a great first impression to what you will mm. discover inside of the book. Um, but opening it up, you also have um, a replicated marbled paper that was done by uh, local Istanbul artists, um, or artist rather, and the cover page that you see on the right was done, was illustrated by one of the girls she photographed, which I think, again, is just really emblematic of um, this empowerment that she is trying to pursue and uh, themes of sisterhood. And so being able to actually represent that sort of, um, or, or manifest that in something physical, such as, um, the cover, the, the title page with this illustration, I think um, is meaningful. I feel like that's really meaningful and sticks out to an audience. So Agatha by Bika, um, I feel like is probably most people have recognized this or seen this already, um, but another great example of design and I'd say, okay. um, yeah, thank you. Um, a great example of design, but also conceptual design. So for those who don't know, these uh, pages are Japanese bound and then the folds are perforated together so that you're able to um, sort of tear them apart um, and it kind of creates a second story. Um, so while there is one narrative that you can see flipping through the images that have not been torn, um, you can also decide to delve in to um, this alternate universe that Bika has created with Agatha, um, the subject of the book. Um, yeah, and, and it's, you know, the, the subject of the book is this relationship that Bika has with Agatha and sort of maybe blurring some lines and trying to um, rediscover her relationship with photography and relationship with Agatha. And I think that these pages um, with the ability to tear them and discover like further into the story also invites the viewer to sort of participate in that exchange. And does the viewer, the viewer now has a choice. Do you want to rip the pages? Like, do you want to explore the second narrative? Um, and so it also poses the same questions that Bika was confronting with Agatha. It poses the same questions with the viewer. Um, sorry, yeah, how it looks like you're- Something I was gonna say, um, by the way, this um, the photographer's Bika Deporter. And um, I'm sorry the video isn't working, which shows a way to slit the pages, but this was, I didn't want to forget that I wanted to ask about video as a way of showing how one can interact with a book or what is a, a book is about. And I see videos like this a lot. Um, Chili or Cameron, do you have any suggestions about how useful video, making a kind of a video of yourself turning the pages or how long they should be, where, where where they're useful? Um, so I'm the one that videos the books for the shop. 
um, and sometimes they go on social media as well. Um, so with Agatha, um, I filmed two videos. So one of them was a short one for Instagram because really the video needs to be short for someone to watch the whole thing. Okay. So roughly 20 seconds. So it's very sped up. Um, and then there was another one for Instagram where you see the book without the torn pages. You go, I go all the way through it. And then I go back to the beginning and I tear the pages. And so you're able to see the book with the alternate narrative. Um, and you get, I feel like it's quite nice to be able to see that and ha then have the choice of whether you want to tear them or not, because there will be people that won't. Yeah, I think it's probably more likely that someone will not tear the pages, but I think the other narrative really adds to the work. And I think it, it's a shame if someone never saw that. Um, so yeah, with these videos, um, I also I also think they're great because it's another it's a resource so I think as a student someone might really like to see these things or someone that doesn't have access to photo bookshops so they could see them for themselves um, yeah so that you are able to experience these books um, yeah so I think it's it's a nice addition to the listings on the site yeah. I think we have one more, Capella, we have one more picture from Agatha by Pika Deporter. Yeah, a little, a sense of it. Um, I'm already thinking of a question I have about this, but let's see, what's the next slide? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Jim Goldberg's um, Fingerprint, which was published by uh, Stanley Barker, um, I think is another great example of this concept of book as object. Um, this is also an extension um, of his uh, Raised by Wolves project, um, which is considered like his seminal work and had, um, he found a lot of success with that and then had this new release of never before seen work, which I think is um, a great way to delve back into your own archive. Um, and, and rediscover work that you've not shown yet, or, or how can you show more of your work? Um, but the actual physical, you know, the physicality of fingerprint, I think is so great. Um, I think it has, you know, it replicates the um, Polaroids that Jim took for Raised by Wolves and they're formatted. They're like these little, they're just like these little replicas. Um, and it, it feels just like you're holding one of the Polaroids that would have been taken. And so I think that there's like this sense of um, originality there. It sort of feels like the ephemera um, that he was creating during that time, um, which I think is special and that holds meaning and that can be meaningful. Um, it's not just a photo book that you flip through, but it's something that you can, that's more tactile and that you can hold in your hands and again, rearrange and shuffle through and I think that there's again this sense of active participation that um that you know the viewer um can participate in um and find a way to rearrange or edit you know sequence the the, the images themselves um which I think is just a, an interesting another sort of portfolio um but but reproduced in a new way yeah. Yeah. And then this is the um, bootleg raised by a wolf. So this is what fingerprint was sort of born from. Um, and the Polaroids were not featured in this work originally. And so then you get to see, you know, another side of this project that was, you know, hugely popular when it was first released. Um, also, Jim was really monumental in, in including text and um, text with his images and found you know, found objects, um, jackets and like cigarette cartons. Um, and so then I think to have another form of book as object and in, in a project where objects were so crucial is um, a great like manifestation of, of the subject matter. And Gilles, whatever you say, say nothing by uh, Steidel is, uh, yeah, what a project. Um, it is 
huge, as you can see. It's these two volumes um, of his work from the Troubles in Ireland, along with sort of an almanac that's detailing all of the images um, in the two volumes. And then it's packaged together um, in cardboard boxes and put into this, I think it's a screen printed tote bag. Um, one thing that really stood out to me when considering this project um, is obviously the, the length and the uh, volume of uh, everything here. And I, I read something that said that the world wasn't or isn't made to be condensed, um, which I think is a great thought when considering this project. Um, it's a complete, you know, sort of catalog of everything Gilles saw during the 70s and 80s in Ireland. And he really plays with the idea of narrative here and completely sort of, um, you know, questioning what that is in the sense of time and sequencing. So I think sequencing is uh, really, you know, core element of this project because it takes place over decades, but he sort of narrows it down, or I shouldn't say narrows, but um, conceives it into these fictional 22 days. Um, and this thought of time sort of just reoccurring and having the same um, events going on and on and over and over and um, having it in this sort of girthy piece where you flip through and continue to relive it. Um, he wanted to create the, what the feeling of being in Ireland during that time was like. Um, so I found that very interesting, uh, dealing with nonlinear timelines and narrative and sequencing and how you can package that together. Um, something that um, Amber reminded us of about this book is that um, it's gotten a lot of press attention. And I suppose that's partly um, the renown um, Gilles has, but I also, um, it's been in a lot of reviews. It was on some best of, you know, those best of photo books of the year roundups and stuff. Um, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions about how one gets that kind of publicity or, um, yeah, think, thoughts on yeah, that? I uh, I think it's important to submit it as much as you can. Um, getting it out there wherever you are able to. Um, I know Chile had a great um, example of Christina de Middle. I don't know, Chile, if you want to talk about that at all. Uh, yes, yeah, so this was Christina with Afronauts. Um, and I heard that the way that she got her book out there is she went to Arles for the photo festival and she handed out her book to influential people, people of note. Um, and that's how her book gained popularity and how, yeah, it was able to be on these lists and for people to know about it. Um, so yeah, I think just the right people seeing your work is obviously important. Um, so yeah, and now it's, I think in its third or fourth edition and that's because she showed it to the right people. <clears throat> yeah, you'd be sitting on a gold mine if she, had, if you were lucky enough to be handed the first edition of the Afronauts. But um, I'll also point out, I mean, this is a really exhaustive, it's not just a photo book. Gilles' book, I think, is, a, is a, like a nonfiction history. And I think that I've, I've seen it written about in um, a publication where sort of news and politics and reflections on history is it's you know it was appropriate and so I think to think broadly about what's the subject of your book and who might cover that um, can be valuable. Next. Yes so um, Martin Parr's Deja Vu uh, was a project with the anonymous project um, and it was printed by Hoxton Mini Press. Um, I don't have a ton to reiterate over this, but I thought it was another great example of delving back into your archive, um, especially when you have someone like Martin Parr and then the Anonymous Project um, who have these huge archives, um, but also a great example of editing and pairing and once again, sequencing. Um, Martin Parr, at, well, now I'm sorry, I forget if it was Martin Parr or um, 
Lee, who is working with the founded the Anonymous Project, but they said that what makes a great photographer is knowing how to choose an image, um, <laughs> which of course, Hard. yeah. Um, and yeah, again, in these cases, it's, I think the um, Anonymous Project had submissions of like 400,000 color slides that they had to first whittle down to their, um, their archive and then what goes into the book. And Martin, of course, has an extensive um, archive and so finding um, collaborations like these where they sing so like harmoniously together. Um, for those of you that don't know, Martin Parr's images are on the left um, of the page on in, each, in all of the book. And then the Anonymous Project pairs it with a visually similar um, image from their archive on the right. Um, and so it's really this visual dialogue between the two of them. And I think in some cases, uh, if you didn't know going through, it would be hard to tell who, which image is Martin Parr and which image is the anonymous project, which I, uh, once you know, you know, but, um, but it's kind of like a fun game and could you, would you be able to tell otherwise? Um, yeah, so I thought, I thought that was a fun one. I, I do have to say that editing, editing is hard for lots of photographers and I think as you'll here when you hear how editors and the designer talk about it, editing for a book is a whole separate challenge that they address in an interesting way. I think I know what this is. What's this camera? Yes, so this is a detail shot from Alex Soth, A Pound of Pictures. Um, I thought another great way of having some physicality to your book um, in each of the copies, there are five randomly so, so well, selected, excuse me, randomly selected um, reproductions of these found photographs that Alec had been working with over the course of his series. Um, and I think it's just a really fun way of seeing what you will get. Like everyone might get, well, everyone will get something different in each of their copies. Um, I think it also, you know, creates this drive to see it, it's, it's limited, it's one of a kind. Um, no one's gonna get the same replicated images. Um, and again, just a really great way of um, mimicking this, the subject of his book. Uh, it's about found photography, why not include some of that in it? Um, and, then the, and then the viewer can do what they want with it, um, which is another form of, I think, active participation and in, in looking through the book. Um, yeah. Sorry, Cameron, I'm just curious, is this, is the, these found pictures come in every edition of the book or is this one of those times when the publisher decides to have special collector's editions with prints included that sell for a, um, a, a higher price? So there is a special edition of this, but in just the regular um, edition, they, these are included in every version and they're reproduced so they're not the originals but then in the special edition you can get the originals that Alec had been handling himself and had been finding um, while he was doing this road trip across America. Um, the special edition also comes with a signed inkjet print from Alec um, but yeah in each of the regular editions so if you go on to Magnum or Mac or wherever and you purchase a copy you will also be getting five randomly selected reproductions which is really cool. I think that's really fun. Um, it, is, it is fun. Yeah. Yeah. Something that not a ton of books are offering. Um, and just another way to, you know, reach different, different people and different audiences. Oh, right. We wanted to talk, um, Emily, we had been talking a little bit about um, the unusual way that, not unusual way, I should, I should say, but when Jonas Bendixson came out with his book, The Last Testament, which is about a handful of people in different parts of the world who believe they are the second coming of the Messiah. Um, he did, he worked with you and others, Emily, on a slightly different variation on the usual, go to a bookstore, do a book signing, do a slideshow. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yes, yes, exactly. So Jonas came to us and told us about this project and, you know, it's a fantastic story. Um, and he 
wanted to create a kind of a presentation, I suppose, that that played off some of the ideas in the book. So the book is about um, the second coming of Christ, people that claim to be uh, the return Messiah. So he created a an artist talk slash presentation that played on the idea of the traveling preacher, um, a lecture essentially borrowing from the form of the sermon and the stylings of a preacher, um, which created a presentation which was part artist talk and part performance. So he came to us with this idea and that then able, enabled us to be able to think about different venues and spaces in which we might be able to approach with this, with the thought that it was both about uh, his photography, his, but also the story. So um, for the launch we did in London, we did it at the Barbican. Um, we spoke to the Norwegian embassy um, about this because Jonas is a Norwegian photographer. Um, and they came on board to then help us to program this. Um, so we, so Jonas gave it this lecture and then we were able to do a signing and a book sale afterwards and then we were able to do a kind of private event which we got some funding for from the embassy um, in which we were able to invite special guests curators writers etc who may be interested in the book um, and then I suppose it it's also worth mentioning that past this Jonas went on to give this presentation at lots of different spaces so at cultural spaces art spaces sure but also much more mainstream spaces or, you know, literary festivals, cultural festivals, religious festivals. And he really kind of thought about how he could, because the work is about these stories, but it's also about the boundaries of religious faith and the mechanics of religion. So he was able to give this presentation in spaces where he had different conversations about the work as well as obviously raising the profile of, of the book itself. Here, let's see if we can see the next slide where we can see him on one of these stages. I think I think this is him, um, Ghost Books, the publisher of The Last Testament provided this. This is at the Barbican Museum. But um, I mean, this interests me for a couple reasons because it's thinking about the audience that would be interested because of the subject. But I think also a publisher who says, okay, photographer, you need to think about how you're going to promote your book to your network. Um, I think that reaching out to the Norwegian, uh, Norwegian cultural organization was thinking kind of broadly about potential audience or potential partners for reaching new audiences. But is that, um, is that a fair assessment, Emmeline? Is that something you have to do often? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, partly because it's a crowded marketplace there are lots of people with new projects so you and and also I mean particularly in the UK um funding is is difficult um so we're always trying to think about or think laterally about who might be interested in this whether it's from a more kind of corporate perspective or a, yeah a different a different angle on kind of culturally who might be interested um, in the work and then you know it's also what the photographer wants to do um, you know I've seen photographers be much more playful with their book launches and think about different ways in which they can kind of engage their audience and if the event itself is something more than just a, a book signing then that in itself often creates a bit of noise or interest that, that kind of builds um, on the, the kind of general interest in the book. Um, yes, and one of the people who's speaking later in the panel is um, Jason Fulford. A, exactly, who a is the best a photographer, example of this. He, a photographer who's also created his own publishing company, but um, he's a big believer, including whimsy. And it sounds from what I've read and what you pointed out to me, Emily, that he incorporates whimsy into his invitations to events and how he organizes the events. So uh, his different events are kind of keyed into the particular book he's highlighting. 
yeah exactly he he's he's super playful with how he how he engages people around the subjects that he's making work about and the subjects that he makes work about are often quite loose but kind of doing these events where you know it might be in a hotel room it might be a bit of a hunt to find where the place is or he might be doing a a kind of playful projection experiment that involves some kind of participation from the viewer it all kind of builds a bit of I think excitement from the viewer's perspective um I like the idea also that um by the way would you say so in other words Jonas in in this you you called it a performance so it was like a monologue it was like performance art for Jonas Bendixson I don't know if he'd be comfortable with performance art but it was certainly it it was between artist talk and performance it was you know him kind of embodying a slightly a different role to that of someone who's just saying this is just recounting the stories he, he's trying to make the lecture a performance um mm -hmm. and so um do you have advice around the same question i asked chili earlier around developing trying to generate press attention and press publicity for a new book? Um, I mean, I can certainly imagine that this um, kind of, that any event that's a little bit beyond the usual um, is helpful for generating buzz and, and perhaps press, but. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's really, it, it's talking to different people. It's using the book. I mean, part of the great thing about having a book is you can use it to reach out to your network and build your network. So, oh. you know, both oh. thinking about trying to get press for your book, sure, but also in terms of you as a film for your future development is a great tool to be able to say to an editor and use it as an excuse to reach out to people and engage with people and say, hey, I've got this book coming out. And it doesn't have to be as cold an exchange as will you feature it or will you write a review of it? It can just be the beginnings of a conversation. Um, yeah. Yeah, or I, I, this is where I'm speaking as a former editor, it, it gives a timely it gives timeliness to the to the subject you know you it's for a news hook for a story oh it's around the time their book comes out so uh great yeah and and, and and actually on the news hook thing thinking about if there are hooks that you can link your book to that is also really helpful for editors so i don't know if it coincides with a particular anniversary or a particular event um that's always a useful thing to think about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um chili and cameron you both there's been a conversation today a little bit about um using social media uh using social media particularly to kind of tease out and and whet people's appetite for what's coming um and i just i want to point out that um when I think of photographers who use social media in that way, um, I did think of Jim Goldberg actually, because I feel like on Instagram, I've seen these collages that he's made for fourth type book. And I thought, what's, what's going on? I wanna know more so that I would recognize it if I saw it in a bookstore. But any other thoughts about um, how to use the medium of social media wisely or maybe how to use it in a way that doesn't give away everything in your book? Um, so the book that you're talking about with Jim is coming and going. So over the past year or more, he's been putting photos on social media of the process of the book. Um, so him kind of making the cover and then this is what the cover will look like. And um, I think, yeah, having a tease of the book coming out, even if it's over that, I mean, that's a long period of time to be teasing. Um, 
But I think things like um, videos of when you're on press and you can see the, the actual production of the book. Um, I think it's a nice element to promoting on social media because whether you are interested in the book or not, or feel that you're going to buy it, actually seeing how that works. Um, it is really interesting, the actual production of a book. Um, uh, yeah, I, I like that as a, a way of showing on social media without pushing your book too much, because sometimes there is a lot of pushing, which is necessary, it's completely necessary, but- You mean like- it. You mean like a hard sell? Yeah. Like, please, please buy my book available at the following booksellers. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. this is, regardless of that, is just a, an interesting thing to see and be a part of the, the process. Um, so with Jim's book, you do feel like you're going along with him because you're seeing the images be made and the cover be made. And um, yeah, I think the process is a great way of pushing your work and getting word out there before you publish it. And so people are aware of it before. Cameron, were you gonna say something? Yeah, yeah, along the lines of maybe not wanting to like give away too much um, before that's actually released. Um, it, it reminds me of an interview that Gregory Halpern did, I believe with Michael Mack, um, just talking about like, not sh maybe showing the images so much, but talking about his process and the his thought process and how he edits and arranges. And so even if it's not specific, um, specific images from that work or showing here's the layout and the design, I think it's interesting to be able to sort of get a sneak peek into, you know, that photographer's head a little bit and how they have organized um, their thoughts and the process of um, their editing. Um, so even if you don't want to show too much, being able to perhaps verbally describe and walk, walk your, um, you know, the community along with you that way is interesting and a different approach. Um, a reminder to the attendees that we're soon coming up on the Q&A period. So if you have more questions for the panelists, um, some questions have already come in, but go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Um, well, you know, that you've evoked an interesting kind of uh, echo there of some things that um, later panelists have said, because there's now there's so much more attention around the book as a, the photo book as a collectible and the photo book as a kind of memento of the photographer's as an, as an expression of their ideas about photography and so on, as a little that you would hold in a book in a way that you don't with a print. I think it's really interesting that while you're going through steps of the process, you can share some of those creative choices that you're, that you're making so that you're exciting people's interest in, in seeing and holding the product, the, the, um, the object in their hand. That's, that's an aspect of bookmaking that I don't know, it's different from seeing installation photos of a show going up or something, you know, as you, as people have to think through their paper, their cover, their sequences, the assembly, and to see that happening is quite interesting. And I can see it exciting a lot of different people. Um, I do wanna say that I, I, I can hear certain designers um, will be talking, and editors will be talking to, every book is interactive you always have to think about how the reader will interact, whether you actually get to shuffle the pages or not. Every, every book comes alive when the reader holds it in their hands and actually turns the pages and thinks about it. So it's an important part. Um, am I cutting us off? Do we have another slide to show? Or we're at the end, right, Capel? Um, Amber, is this a good time to start taking questions? I have more questions myself, but I don't want to uh, limit our attendees chance to um, the attendees in the audience's chance to ask questions. Yes, we have many questions. Thank you all. A question about print runs. <clears throat> oh, curious what print runs um, some of these books had and how many were printed at the start? Are they ever done on demand? 
That's, I think it's a really good question. I think you have to think about what your print, it's part of thinking about your audience and who you want to reach. And do you want to go to collectors and that makes a big difference. You want to go to collectors or a mass audience makes a big difference in your um, print run. Can you tell us some, for example, do you guys know about how um, many copies say of Gilles Perez's book are out in the world or how many copies of, um, say, Omaha Sketchbook by Gregory Halpern are out there? I need to double check on Gilles Perez, but um, I think it's only a couple hundred if I'm not mistaken. Um, I can double check, fact check that, but um, yeah, it's only a couple hundred, which again kind of adds to this collectability aspect to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's only here for a limited amount of, or for a, an limited quantity, it, it might go fast. Mm -hmm. And I noticed um, Gregory Halpern, whose um, Omaha sketchbook uh, you showed, I don't know about Omaha sketchbook, he did mention that another award-winning book that he published, whose name I don't like to pronounce because it begins with Z and I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Zizix, right? You. Thanks, Julie. Um, he's like on his third printing. Which, so, so I think uh, it's fourth is coming out now, fourth edition. Um, same thing, how a bit about, does that mean fourth edition of like a hundred or fourth edition of like 5,000 or do you have any idea? I think often books like that, I would say is between 1,000 and 5,000, closer probably with that to 5,000. Um, and I don't know whether the more editions there are, the more copies there are because it shows that it's high in demand if they're doing another edition. So I don't, um, I think in terms of print run, it's not something that I look at so much unless I know that it's a book that has a small run. So usually you are aware of the print run is 800 or less because it feels more collectible then. Um, so yeah, I think print run is not something that I tend to look at I think mm -hmm. you really are made aware when something is a smaller run because it shows desirability and yeah usually it's I don't know it can tend to be more expensive because the more books you print in terms of units the cheaper it will be for you as a publisher or a photographer so yeah I think that it tends to be that the smaller print runs yeah, you, you are made aware of that. I should so, also say that I've talked in talking to publishers and I mean, this is like through the years, I, I don't think it's very typical for even a book, a photo book by a, um, you know, an independent book publisher to sell. I don't think they expect to sell more than 5,000 copies and that would be considered a very successful book. Um, something like these lovely little portfolio books that, Port portfolio boxes of books and that I assume is for a smaller audience and printed in a smaller number, correct? Yeah, I can um, speak to the Christina DeMittal Wombat Art Box. I know that that one um, is an edition of 500 and it's um, numbered and editioned by hand on the box itself. So you can see, oh, I have edition 500 or sorry, 45 out of 500. Um, whereas uh, the portfolio like outs, um, I believe it's also an edition of 500, but it's not labeled. Um, so there's a little less preciousness to it there. Um, but yeah, they're usually in smaller editions. And on this topic of editioning, we have a question. Or do you have any recommendations on maximum copies for first editions? I think the the less that you do, the quicker it can sell. So there is always that question of, will you, I mean, in terms of money, will you make more money doing a smaller edition and be more likely to sell out versus making more and maybe selling more, but in terms of price, you might have priced it slightly lower. So that's always a question of whether you're going to do a smaller or bigger, but I think 
the larger your print run, the less likely you are to state how many. So I believe that Mac don't actually say, unless it's a special edition, I don't think that they say how many. Sorry, you, you're referring to Mac books, the pub, the yeah, so I, several I books that we've seen. Think, I think that they don't actually mention the I number. Think it, I think they only do for the special editions, yeah. I, I think because, it tends to generally be the smaller publishers that mention how many how many in the print run and they yeah, and, and that and that tends lower. to be like 500 to a thousand copies but also the other thing to think about is you also don't want to be left with boxes and boxes and boxes of books that are taking up your whole flat <laughs> so if you're distributing the book yourself or well, this is something that often smaller publishers are thinking about you know it's, it's storage and and yeah um so. emily that's why we're talking about promotion so the <laughs> photographers many of whom i know are have a hundred cop copies because that was their publishing deal are still trying to sell them out of their basements or their or their parents garages mm -hmm. yeah um, <laughs> emily for people who don't know can you talk about what happens to the books that don't sell over uh, time do do publishers sometimes um like how do they dispose of them or i mean i think if a book really doesn't sell then the books get scrapped um mm -hmm. but but generally they they sit their own boxes and yeah mm -hmm. people are, or, or they, they end up getting discounted which so you don't want to print a really large print run and then end up discounting or losing money on the on the run this is this is an actually these are really interesting questions that I'm definitely going to be asking of Saurabh Pura, who, as we said, at self choosing to self publish all his books so far has really thought a lot about printing and distribution, um, and has really also interesting thoughts on his the ideal reader he wanted to reach. So. I think what one thing that um, I really remember someone telling me when I was thinking about my book was um, was to consider the size because if you're self-publishing it and you're shipping books, if if a book is of a certain size, it can be packaged in like a you know an A4 envelope and shipping is cheaper. I can't remember exactly what the dimensions are. But like once it goes over a certain size, then the shipping just shoots up. So it's like a super practical thing, but it's something that certainly I didn't, I wouldn't have thought about myself. Um, yeah, that was Matt Stewart that told me that. Yep. You got to pack all those up and send them out. Mm, yeah. Think about what boxes you can buy. <laughs> um, well, we have so many questions coming in. Thanks to this audience for your engagement. Um, okay, when you make a book, how do you think about who your audience is? Uh, do common people who are not artists purchase photo books? We hope so. <laughs> yeah. Any, any thoughts from our panelists? On how to think about who your real audience is? I mean, I think that Matt Black's American Geography is, again, a good example of that, something that I touched on earlier, um, representing these communities. Um, he speaks about, if you know the feeling, you know, you can relate to it, and there's so many people that can relate to it, and that his publications were for the, you know, working class America, too, not just for um, devoted photography with loyalists, so to, so to speak. Um, but I do also think that, again, design can, in the format of your book, can reach out to people um, even before they necessarily open the book. Um, that's sometimes your first introduction to people. But um, yeah, subject can play such, play such a big hand into who will be looking and viewing your work. And, and I think the publisher, um, just a note on Matt's book. Um, so he published a book with Tempt and Hudson who have a really, really wide um, audience and distribution network. So rather than going with a perhaps more niche photo book, art book publisher like Mac, who in the materials they choose might make different choices, 
Matt chose to go with someone like Tempton Hudson, who he know, knew would do a really large print run at, 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 and it could be still kept at an affordable price point. And also Tempton Hudson with their kind of, with their own networks, it means it has a slightly more universality to it. Right, a great distribution network, meaning they're going to get in into lots and lots and lots of bookstores, not just yeah. not just the bookstore attached to a museum or a specialist in photo books, but the place where you go in to buy Christmas books and stuff. Yeah, like Yeah, exactly. And I and you know, if anyone is talking to publishers or looking at publishers. I think something to be aware of in terms of what you're discussing with the publisher is what their distribution is, what their distribution network is, because it will affect how your book gets out into the world, where your book gets seen, um, you know, what bookshops it might be represented in, for example. Um, and I would say in terms of subject matter, there is the chance that you could reach people outside of photography that's a way of doing it so what Emily was saying about Jonas um, but there are plenty of books where the subject matter would appeal to someone outside of photography but also um, yeah in terms of design your photo book could be at an art book fair and there can be people visiting it which are and they're interested in just graphic design as a whole um, and they'd pick up the book and they might not have picked up a photo book, but it's the design of the book. So I think, yeah, interesting design to appeal to people that are interested in art books and also some subject matters that appeal to a wider audience. Um, and actually in a sense, having something more niche as a subject matter might make your book yeah, I guess more desirable because if you're interested in a niche subject, you're probably very niche. You're probably, yeah, very interested in it. So something like that would appeal to you, maybe. So this dovetails nicely into the next question. Do any of you have an opinion about very small volume handmade photo books as works of art in themselves or something along those lines? They are. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. The answer is yes. You know, I. Yeah, absolutely. And there are collectors that will specifically collect those. It's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's like an edition print. Um, artist books definitely have a place in, in the market, in, in artistic practice, in, I mean, museums collect them. Um, yeah. I think we'll talk about this a little bit uh, in the first session with Martin Parr, who is also been an avid collector of photo books and um, uh, Dr. Nakamori from the Tate Modern, a photo curator who also is in charge of photo books. But um, there is a long legacy, I think, of the artist book. Um, finding its way to collectors and avid people. There's kind of a history of that even before it kind of reached the photo book world as we know it now, but um, with more photographers getting into self-publishing, also more designers helping make these books and more little independent publishers springing up to help, um, help other photographers make these small edition artist books. Um, there's a great deal of interest in them by collectors who might not, and also I talk to people who are into collecting photo books because they can't always afford to purchase fine art prints in a gallery. Yeah, I think being able to physically own your favorite photographer's book, you might not yeah. be able to buy a print, but you know that you own something. And also often you can't see all the images online of the book, so that's part mm. of it as well. But yeah, I guess, yeah owning the object is partially why you might buy a photo book. And yes. You, oh, Go ahead, Emily. No, I was just going to say, if you look at someone like Raymond Meeks, um, American photographer, he um, makes a lot of artist books um, and they're like beautiful, beautiful, beautiful objects. And that then just increases the interest in his, because he also 
publishers books that have a more commercial run like he publishes with Mac um, so the two kind of speak to each other and feed into each other one thing I sorry I just sorry you see, whoever asked this question opened the can of worms um, I'll also say that I can think of examples over the years where people made or self-published a small edition uh, artist run artist book and I, I think because that's the format they wanted to publish but it created so much attention that later a publisher was interested in it you know they may have made an edition of only a few hundred it sold out and but it was like a proof of their concept I, I don't this isn't why they did it I think they did it as an artistic expression but nonetheless it excited people's imagination and interest and from that it got the attention of a publisher a, a more commercial trade publisher so to continue a bit on this thread, uh, we have a question and also a comment. What are the sizes of the editions you are showing? I make artist books and have made 23 books, usually editions of 20, sold to museums, institutions, and collectors. I am intrigued by the boxes. What size are those editions? Cameron, Cam, did you say earlier with one box? Did you look at one? Yeah, so Wombat is 500, uh, an edition of 500. Um, same with Skylark editions. Um, so those are the ones that the, those are the numbers that, you know, they're living in. But I think you can limit it down even further to, you know, increase the value of this collectability. Um, the fewer there are in the world, the more precious they are, the more exclusive they are. Um, so I think that's the ball's kind of in your court in that way. Um, but for Wamba and Skylark editions, they're an edition of 500. How many, sorry, Amber, how, what the question was, how the photographer has done how many different books and editions of about 23? What were those numbers? I can't remember, but I, I'm quite, I don't know. I can see that there, someone out there is a fan of the photographer and is gonna to wanna to collect them all. Yeah, she made 23 books, usually editions of 20. That, that museums and collectors are interested in, mm -hmm. yeah. All handmade. Yep. Yeah. Um, Congrats. Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe this is a question for Emily. Sorry, I just have to go back to it. Is it common or advisable to work with an editor when self-publishing? Um, it depends how confident you are. I mean, I would say if you are self-publishing, involve lots of people in the process. So you have, um, so you have people to bounce ideas off basically, because I think very often with your own work, um, you have a certain idea of, of, of how you want to structure it. But I think showing showing it to lots of different people as you're making it also gets people invested in the work in a way um you know if you go to portfolio reviews and and or if you go back to people as the work is evolving um that just kind of builds people's uh engagement with your work and process and I, I think you know working with an editor well, I mean, I would say an editor or a designer would, is perhaps more essential than an editor. It depends. It really, really depends on the work and how confident you are as an editor of your own work and exactly what you're trying to do um, with the book. I, I would add that I think there are designers who work with a lot of self-published photographers who are self-publishing because the production and printing processes that requires some specialized expertise, but but you know then you're paying a you're paying a designer. So good questions that we'll Thanks. ask both the both the designers and Sarab, our self-publishing expert. 
I mean, the, the other thing to think about with involving a designer in the process is a designer is often familiar with the materials um, of, of printing or, or the process, especially if you work with a designer who works with photo books, they'll be experienced with um, the, the process of putting a book together for print. So we'll think about some of the things that you might not as an individual or as a photographer think about like you know pictures going over the gutter and how much of a picture you lose by it going across the gutter stuff like that that is it's just much more kind of technical I suppose than than about the actual photography um yeah so so designers can be beneficial from lots of different points of view thank you Here's a different kind of question. Not a marketing question, but more of a book construction question. I recall that Alex Soth once discussed how he didn't like putting photos on the left-hand pages because of how the, the opening of the book and turning the pages distorts the image on the left-hand page. How do the photographers with whom you have worked feel about images on the left-hand page? Yeah, I've never, never heard anyone else say that before. Um, wait till you, I hope we'll have time when Alessandra Sanguinetti speaks. Um, she has shared some layouts of a work in progress and um, the pacing and double spreads versus single page, single photos on a spread. I mean, She's in the hard part of the process, she says. It's really a struggle at this point. And I think she, that's one of the many, many questions ahead of her. But I'll just say, knowing that there's some editors watching us, I'll just say I am fascinated by, like, The Coast, the Sarab Hura book in which, it, I, I'm just fascinated by how we derive meaning from photos depending that how sequence influences how we derive meaning from photos. That's what I mean to say. And I just think juxtapositions of photos can be fascinating to see. And in the coast, for example, where Sarab experiments with that, it's fascinating. So there, I'd say, don't, don't be afraid to pair images. Yeah, sequencing is definitely very important. And also how you decide to sequence, whether you're doing it on theme or what's actually in the image. Um, there are so many different ways to sequence, but yeah, it really does shape the work and the message that you're trying to convey. So sequencing is very important, as yeah. I'm sure everyone knows. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about pitching. We have a few questions related to that. Is it common practice to cold call publishers with a project or is it necessary or expected to proceed through a referral? Can you share any insights on that? Can I speak? Probably people don't want to hear from me, but um, well, not to get a cop out. That's definitely a question I want to ask um, the editors and the book publisher on the panel, but, and certainly there are book publishers, you can find their submission guidelines are up on their website and you can, I find those to be helpful ways of thinking about how you want to shape a pitch, whether you pitch that particular photographer or not. Is it, has anyone ever here heard of someone who cold called a, photog a book publisher and got a book published that way without first showing it at a portfolio review or a meeting or something? I haven't. Uh, it's how it's how my book came about. Oh, very good. Congrats. <laughs> oh, that's great, Emily, because we have a question here um, for you. Um, wait, wait. So back up a little bit. What is that yeah. cold call meant? You, you put your images to what did you what did you send off to your publisher uh I, I put together a short proposal like a pdf document and i and i sent an accompanying email you know i had done my research i like the publisher right i knew who i was sending it to and i think if you're gonna send a cold email you've got to be you've got to kind of know who you're talking to and kind of 
um, address the email accordingly. But um, yeah. How many pick? Come on, details. How many pictures did you include? How long was your book description? Could you also talk about your project? <laughs> <laughs> we have a question here asking if you could talk about how you put that together. Um, so the uh, the proposal was. So I, I'd spent a long time thinking about the book. I'd made various dummies. I have, you know, I, I learned how to book bind. I made my um, various versions of the book. I looked at papers, blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I'd spent a lot of time considering this. And so the proposal was like a summary of the book. It was a picture of the book, book dummy. So there was a kind of, physicality to it and then there was um some text about me and you know recognition that the work had got and uh maybe a handful of pictures maybe like six pictures from the book yeah oh. um yeah not many um let me ask you about sending or showing that you had made a dummy did your publisher keep the design that you had created exactly the same or did they bring in their own designer and say tisk tisk we can do much better <laughs> they didn't say like that but um yeah they they redesigned it i mean there are there are elements of it that have remained the same i think i think in terms of the structure of the the book in terms of the sequence that has i mean so actually maybe it's more helpful to kind of explain they said so they wanted to see everything so I, I i kind of showed them a digital version of my dummy and then when we agreed to start working on that they wanted to see a wide edit and i think that's really common mm -hmm. with publishers um because i suppose they want to know that the edit and the sequence is um as good as it can be and you know they also want to have their own take on it and so in, with my publishers, they have an editor and a designer. So I worked with both of those and they brought in a handful of new pictures. Um, the structure of the, of the edit stayed the same in terms of like I had, so the work is about, um, the work is about, it's a play on a story of a real unsolved treasure hunt. Um, and the work is about what happens when you can't find what you're looking for. So I had a structure for the book, which is about going from a, like starting a journey from a very optimistic place um, and the tone of the book becoming less clear and more maddening and more strange the more that you got into it. So that structure stayed the same, but they played with it and added new elements to it and they added a whole other design element um yeah um emily i'm expecting fantastic promotional events uh around this <laughs> interesting book i'm waiting for my invitation to a treasure hunt i'm waiting to, I'm waiting to find out when you invite different book reviewers and and museums to join in in participate in a treasure hunt or something i'm ex we're, we're going to be expecting big things for your, <laughs> for your brilliant publicity it's coming i'm working or, on it <laughs> um or just a nice um or just a nice um book signing um by the way i forgot to mention that the a new bookstore is opening at the magnum gallery in london which will be um, it's opening right around uh, Photo London. So I'll be interested to find out later after Photo London, did the new bookstore at the Magnum Gallery bring collectors or people who, you know, people who just are interested in beautiful photos or people who are interested in the subjects of the book. Okay, that was a lot of chit chat, but who knew Emily would be a font of information? <laughs> um, other question? Maybe we have time for one more question. And so sorry, we won't be able to get to everyone's questions today, but we do hope to see you again. How important is it to have an existing curator, editor, or photographer to write an opening for your book? Any quick reactions to that? Thoughts? 
I mean, I find that it's, it's always, always beneficial, uh, what an advantage it is, but I don't think that it's necessary. Um, your, your work can sing and stand on its own, um, but if you have someone that can provide that for you, I think that's an excellent asset to have as well. I don't know what everybody else thinks. I think it depends a little bit on your audience. Um, I, I'm trying to remember some examples, but there's sometimes where um, having an author who's maybe not a photo expert, but is an expert in a particular topic, um, it kind of gave the book a certain credibility and it also helped booksellers figure out the different ways that they could display it, you know, by if relating it to the subject or something. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, think, oh, sorry. Sorry, do you want to go? Oh, I was just going to say, uh, no, I mean, obviously, if you have a, a very established curator add their weight to the book, it, it, it immediately gives a book a certain weight, but it's whether that makes sense with your book, whether that text is really kind of adding something to your book. But uh, something else that can be really nice to do is getting, you know, a piece of fiction or, or, or an essay by a writer from um, a different background, like um, Philip Montgomery's American Mirror has a text by Patrick Radden Keith. And Patrick Radden Keith is, um, he writes for The New Yorker, he's a nonfiction author. He has um, a, a kind of internationally recognized reputation. And I think that not only helps in anchoring the book in a certain way, but interestingly, it also helps in, in bookstores, like weirdly where the book is placed, like having an essay by an author like that in a more mainstream bookstore can also mean that the book will get categorized um, in, um, in, in against the issues rather than the photographs, like mm. so often in mainstream, like in foils or what have, what have you, photo books get put in a niche bit of display with art books um, or photo books rather than kind of being against the subject matter. Whereas like, if, yeah, the text can change that interestingly. Thanks, um, Emily. Okay, well, I think we're at time. Sorry, Holly, did you want to add anything? Well, I remember else? that in cutting off the slides, I think we have mm -hmm. um, a little information about the first panel, um, which is next Wednesday. What do people have to know if they want a little bit more about registering and when and that kind of thing? Do we have any useful housekeeping information to provide if anyone wants to come back for more panels? Uh, yes, so if you would like to purchase a ticket for the rest of the seminar, you, you can do and you can do so until April 21st, which is the last seminar. Um, but we do hope you'll join us live so that you can come back with your questions and all registrants will receive a recording that is available for a limited time. Is there anything else I'm forgetting, Capella? Um, no, just that, I guess, if you don't have the time or you're busy during any of the sessions, it's fine because the recording gets sent. Um, so don't be concerned about that, I guess, if there are some you can't make. Um, it should be really great. And we're looking forward to it. Um, I know what I forgot to say. I forgot to thank our panelists for excellent information and great examples. And I forgot to thank our audience for providing um, excellent questions. Yes, thank you, Holly, and thanks, Capella, and to our panelists. This was really wonderful and so happy that we had such an engaging audience. Thank you. Thanks. I hope to see some of you soon. Have a nice day or evening. Or evening. <laughs> or evening for our, for our friends in England and Europe yeah. and elsewhere. Thanks. Aww, thanks, everyone.